So good afternoon, Dr. Topsoy. I'd like to ask you a few questions, starting with the following. What factors, including family, friends, and teachers, were influential in your choice of career and beyond? Well, <coughs> I was asked almost the same question when recently paying a visit to friends in China. And uh, therefore, I will give you a note uh, where that I prepared for these friends. But let me answer it verbally now. Uh, firstly, uh, I had to choose uh, what I would like to study after leaving school. Leaving school. I uh, uh, wanted to uh, focus on uh, studying uh, physics and uh, uh, therefore applied for uh, uh, space in uh, uh, the Niels Bohr Institute uh, amongst other uh, young students. Uh, Niels Bohr was very kind to me, so uh, I could follow uh, uh, his uh, lectures and the lectures of the many other uh, first-class physicists who came to what later was called the Copenhagen School of Niels Bohr. Uh, I was interested not in atomic uh, physics, I was interested in uh, theoretical physics to be used for other purposes, also to understand chemical uh, compounds, to, uh, to understand compounds in a more penetrating way to understand what happened in uh, uh, chemical processes. And uh, next to Niels Bohr, we had the Institute of uh, uh, Bronsted, the N. Bronsted, uh, which was one of the famous uh, chemists working with theoretical chemistry. Of course, we all know uh, Bronsted's work about acidity, etc. Now, uh, therefore, it was uh, very fine for me that I could uh, uh, go and study at the Sports Institute, but also spend some time with Bronsted. Fortunately, believe it or not, such a young man uh, uh, could uh, make friends with both the Sports and uh, Bronsted. And of course, it also played a big role for me that uh, at both institutes, many uh, foreigners came to study, particularly, of course, at the sport, where we uh, always had a number of uh, uh, scientists, uh, some having the Nobel Prize, some to get it. Therefore, during my study years in the early 30s, I almost uh, as you would say, rubbed shoulders with uh, uh, Nobel Prize winners. So uh, why, why did I uh, like uh, uh, to study at these two institutes? Because I was sure that uh, uh, better understanding of uh, molecule structure, of atomic structures, and uh, how, how they interacted, the uh, involved uh, energies and energy changes uh, would mean uh, uh, something for the future of chemistry, also for the future of chemical processing in industry. Okay. So that actually led you eventually to studying uh, chemical engineering, correct? Yeah, yes. Uh, <coughs> well, that's a long story, but uh, um, after my study years, I wanted to uh, uh, stay with the university, with the Sports Institute, and indeed, he uh, offered me uh, a space uh, and a position as a, a young uh, scientists, but uh, I didn't work. I didn't want to work only with uh, uh, theory. I also wanted to work experimentally, 
And uh, because of crisis in the days of the 30s, there was no money for experimental uh, work at the institute. Therefore, I uh, uh, was a little bit uh, frustrated and uh, accepted uh, or uh, got uh, a position in industry. Uh, I spent four years in uh, an industrial company, a uh, world-known company, working more or less all over the world. And uh, I there saw how important it was in uh, industry to uh, have a deeper understanding of uh, what really happened when you process some uh, feed to end product. I also uh, had the pleasure of getting to know many, many people in industry, uh, not, not so much in, uh, in uh, Denmark, but in uh, uh, countries uh, more or less uh, all over the world where this company worked. Uh, then, of course, uh, the war came. And uh, in, uh, uh, in the uh, early years of the war, in the very early period of the war, Denmark was not occupied. We were occupied the 9th of April, 1940. And uh, 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 that was uh, then uh, <coughs> a day when uh, really uh, my wife and I uh, had uh, uh, planned to uh, leave to the United States. And uh, therefore, uh, during the day of occupation, the American embassy uh, invited us to uh, come to uh, China, to uh, the US, and would help us uh, coming over there. Unfortunately, our uh, two children were very ill, and therefore we could not travel. So we decided to stay in uh, Denmark, and on the 10th of April, we uh, started the company. And uh, uh, my wife said to me that uh, now you can't uh, go to the States, and uh, because of uh, the war, you cannot expect to have a position in uh, universities in Denmark. So uh, you must uh, now plan to do something, set up something that will be of value after the war. And uh, I said, fine, I understand that. But uh, uh, in order to uh, do that, I had to find a place where I could work and uh, we were very fortunate that I could work during the war years and many years after in Sweden and uh, built quite a substantial company in Sweden. I'm not sure I'm asking, uh, answering your questions, but uh, uh, this, this company, uh, of course, had to uh, uh, find a way of uh, earning money and we decided, uh, because of my interest in physics and chemistry, uh, an interest shared by the colleagues we had from the beginning, we decided that we would concentrate, focus on catalysis. We thought that catalysis would uh, uh, offer us uh, everything we wanted, uh, offer us uh, uh, possibility to use our more scientific interest, offer us a possibility to manufacture catalysts, do engineering, and develop processes, and uh, thus uh, earn sufficient money to justify our work with more uh, theoretical scientific problems. And indeed, uh, catalysis grow to be very important. So as you all know, we uh, had um, uh, 
uh, very, very, very limited uh, activity in industry worldwide based on uh, catalysis. And today, more than 90% of all manufacturing is based on uh, catalysis uh, involving catalysts and catalytic processes. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Topso, you already referred some early difficulties that you were faced in, in your life, including going through the war years. So um, I'd like to ask you, going beyond the war years, what other major difficulties did you feel that you experienced in your career? Uh, well, uh, if you are talking about everything that happened since uh, the 10th of April 1940, 70 years ago, well, uh, the major difficulties have always uh, be, been, I think, to uh, uh, have uh, our company run uh, uh, with sufficient generation of money to pay for a growing staff, to pay for to pay for uh, scientific work, to pay for pay for equipment we needed, and. Uh, for many, many years, uh, uh, this was a problem that, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, caused us to look into every day when we had to pay our workers or staff and uh, 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 hope that we could generate enough money to pay them. The uh, <coughs> other major problems of course, was uh, to uh, <coughs> uh, get business, simply to sell what we could offer, catalysts and uh, technologies and uh, uh, design of plants. Of course, we wanted to uh, do all, this, all we did in order to bring something to industry. We wanted to build uh, plants, design and build plants for others, plants which uh, were based on catalysis, and we wanted to build uh, catalyst manufacturing plants for ourselves. And uh, <coughs> the latter, of course, uh, necessitated liquidity. I was just speaking about, uh, speaking about uh, and uh, uh, the former to build plants for others, of course, necessitated from the very beginning, we had to focus on several things. To focus on creating new knowledge, doing no, new fundamental uh, science work, to focus on doing engineering, to come from scientific results to practical design of plants and so on, to, uh, and to sell, to find clients to sell. So you might say that uh, our main problem was to come from uh, what we called science to dollars, from uh, 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 developing new knowledge that could be used to uh, uh, get business. Okay, thank you. Now that we spoke about major difficulties, maybe it's a good time to talk about major accomplishments, in your own view. Uh, that's a very difficult question, because if you uh, speak, as I'm sure you do, uh, from a scientific, point, a scientific point of view, uh, I do not think that I can look back on a very major scientific accomplishments I uh, can be credited for. I think that my main accomplishment may be is to create a unit, a business unit that made it possible for other, other scientists, engineers, and operators 
to work. So in a way, I think my accomplishment was to uh, uh, put together uh, everything it took to uh, have a home for what we were interested in. Uh, I, I, uh, for instance, uh, uh, George de Hevesy, a very good friend of uh, our family, uh, and he uh, told me that uh, he didn't think I would be a very good scientist, but I would be a good uh, fellow to create a home for good scientists. Yeah, that's an interesting statement. He must have had some good signs in order to say that. Uh, yeah, maybe. Uh, I, 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 I think I got uh, uh, quite a good understanding or what uh, theoretical physics could do for our field, what we were interested in. And I also, at the Sports Institute, did a lot of work with others and, <coughs> and wrote uh, some papers uh, which, uh, if I had stayed in at the university, uh, would have been used for, for maybe a PhD, as you call it, in the, in the US. Maybe, but uh, uh, once I decided that in uh, 36, I could not uh, expe expect to get a good position at university, of course I forgot it and uh, tried to accomplish everything you had to accomplish in an industrial company. Uh, I think that uh, what we could there accomplish was to bring a lot more science into industry. But uh, that is something specific for every industry, every industrial company. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So let me continue with another question that actually it couples to what you just said. I have been reading your company's uh, leaflets uh, including the Halder Topsoil's website, and I quote, understanding is the basis of development. That's your own saying. One unique characteristic of your company is the emphasis that has been putting on fundamental research and its serious long-term investment on that. This is in contrast to what other major companies unfortunately seem to be doing recently. Can you rationalize your approach, philosophy, to investing in fundamental science to us? Well, <coughs> uh, firstly, I think that uh, for us, uh, investment in uh, fundamental science was to create new knowledge. Obviously, uh, you might say that you should not uh, study in uh, fundamental scientific matters uh, if you are not sure that it could be used industrially. But I think if you take that approach, you uh, may risk to uh, uh, create neither new, uh, new knowledge nor new business. So therefore, I think that uh, the important thing is to uh, this is to be uh, really enthusiastic about creating new knowledge. And then, of course, if you have a company, a company has to do business, and therefore, uh, of course, you have to uh, uh, then ask yourself, to what extent can a company, could our company, afford to do uh, uh, scientific studies only to create new knowledge. Uh, I would say that uh, the way things have developed, we are in a situation where uh, we uh, can uh, permit ourselves to spend maybe 20% uh, or more of uh, our efforts in R&D to create just knowledge, and the rest we have 
to focus on, uh, on uh, scientific work that we are reasonably sure will be uh, a value for the business. But let me say something about this, reasonably sure. Uh, if you uh, want to do something real new and uh, not just polish existing knowledge a little bit, then uh, you cannot know that you uh, uh, have a result. Uh, you can, uh, if you want to do something really new, you cannot be sure that you uh, get some new knowledge, nor can you be sure that you uh, create something that's useful for industry. Uh, but uh, this whole play between uh, fundamental science and business is a very, in uh, very intriguing one. Uh, in our situation, it uh, necessitates that we focus on the things we want to do from the beginning. And also that we <coughs> uh, keep uh, bringing to industry only uh, something which we have uh, uh, created ourselves. So that everything we do to, for industry, for business, must be anchored in fundamental science. And also it has another intriguing problem that's come from uh, fundamental scientific results to something you can use in industry. You might call it a scale-up. Of course, if you uh, do experimental work, the scale-up is a good term. If you do theoretical work, as we also do, for instance, in, in uh, uh, DFT, as you have worked on in yourself, then uh, uh, this uh, scale-up takes on a completely different character. But uh, uh, trying to come back to your question, uh, <coughs> we, uh, we think that uh, besides uh, doing uh, fundamental work just for creating new knowledge, we uh, are trying to do fundamental work where we know from the beginning that if we are successful, it can be used in catalysis in industry. Uh, now, even so, uh, of course, you are not uh, successful. If you uh, take our situation, I think we have been rather lucky by having a really high, uh, quite high, quite acceptable success rate. But I should think that if you uh, uh, look at all the projects we have started to uh, create new knowledge or create new business, I th think that uh, we may approach a, a one to two uh, success rate, which I think is uh, very satisfactory. Now, Dr. Topso, if I could elaborate a little bit on the last point you made. Throughout your 70-year career with the company, or more, you have launched hundreds or thousands of projects within the company, either for creating new knowledge or always with the hope that there will be something useful for industry through catalysis. To be realistic, and for the young students that may be listening to this interview in the future, and have an interest in entrepreneurial activity to build a new company up that would be based in Catalis or something related to chemical engineering. What fraction of these projects that you launched, you will be happy to know that uh, they came to fruition and to industrial practice? Is it just 1%? Is it 10%? Is fraction of 1%? What is realistically to be expected? Uh, probably uh, more than a third were successful. But in many cases, they lead to processes uh, which uh, uh, were uh, not uh, at the time useful for industry. You see, uh, uh, if uh, you uh, 
look upon uh, what all the green people uh, uh, talk about today, it's interesting to see that some of us, uh, also our company, were ahead of our time. We did some uh, work to protect the atmosphere uh, more than a generation ago. We uh, managed to show that it was uh, useful, could work, but uh, we were ahead of time. So uh, therefore, uh, in a way, it was a failure that cost us a lot of money. That has happened again and again. And uh, therefore, you, uh, when you talk about successful, you uh, have to realize that uh, developments in, uh, in uh, science and in uh, technology have somehow to fit a time pattern that uh, 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 is uh, uh, developed by industry. But then you also have a peculiar problem that we didn't really realize when we were young. Namely, that uh, more and more uh, the uh, uh, more and more political forces interfere. More and more people in uh, governments uh, they uh, are the ones who uh, decide what uh, we can do and what we can't do. And uh, for instance, if you take uh, actual problems uh, concerning the atmosphere the climate business and all that, we here have now to uh, dance to the tune of uh, many political leaders who uh, uh, tell us uh, that is uh, what we are allowed to put into the atmosphere or into the ocean and so on. And also uh, uh, tell us that uh, we may have to uh, somehow uh, uh, solve the, the problem of CO2 uh, and uh, uh, maybe even uh, uh, we would have to uh, uh, bring down the CO2 emission drastically and uh, for instance develop uh, 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 energy technologies which uh, can uh, uh, rest in themselves by recycles and so on. Uh, some of our political leaders have uh, made statements that we have in a short number of years to bring down uh, the CO2 emission to uh, half or something. Uh, and uh, uh, th this, of course, creates uh, some problems. Some problems we can foresee some problem where still we don't know what the political leaders nationally and internationally will decide shall be the, uh, the goal. Also, some may say that we are only allowed to send out CO2 to the atmosphere if we know how to sequester the same amount. And uh, this, that means that we uh, have uh, the uh, time sequence of uh, coming from uh, fundamental science to useful technologies to from science to dollars, as I said, which is a business in a company like ours, inside the company. We have the time uh, schedule of industrial developments that ho hopefully will uh, need what we bring to the industry when we bring it, and we have the political leaders that sometimes may completely destroy all sorts of reasonable planning. And I also hope that uh, we will see a way of uh, having a real uh, fundamental, acceptable, and reliable science, science work playing a major role in all these political plannings. Okay, thank you. Which actually brings me to a next question, Dr. Topse. Do you think that
politicians, say, of the past several decades have not been adequately uh, educated in science or engineering to the extent that would um, be more realistic in their announcements and their decisions, what would be an ideal politician in your view? An ideal politician? Right. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, I can't answer that uh, question. I have never myself been uh, in, uh, interested in uh, going into politics. I have had the uh, uh, privilege to uh, uh, follow many things that happen. I've had the privilege of, in many countries of the world, uh, knowing politicians, participating in discussions with them, sometimes in, even in planning. But uh, uh, the answer to your question, what is uh, ideal specification for uh, first-class politicians, I don't know. But I can say one thing, that uh, what we lack today more may internationally, more than maybe anything else, is uh, real first-class politicians with ideals to make everything better for everyone in the world. Uh, we, of course, have some, but we uh, uh, need many more political leaders all around the world who uh, would uh, uh, really emphasize, put as their ideas what they want to achieve to make a better life for everybody all over the world. Now that we spoke about major accomplishments, perhaps you can comment on major problems uh, that you have faced in your career. Uh, uh, the most important uh, problems for chemical engineering have to do with resources. And uh, uh, here, by far, the most important is, uh, I think, energy. Uh, people have not uh, uh, sufficiently uh, realized how important energy is. It's so uh, un uh, peculiar that when you go back uh, to my study years, uh, uh, nobody, not even the very big energy companies, uh, thought uh, that there was much of a problem. Of course, the main source of energy at the time was uh, uh, hydrocarbons, oil and gas, and coal. Uh, and uh, uh, particularly those uh, responsible for uh, oil and gas resources, they uh, didn't care l at all. They all knew that they had uh, known resources in hydrocarbons for maybe only a dozen years, but they didn't care. And this was a mystery to me. Now, uh, when you then uh, uh, move uh, uh, to the years after the war, you had the Club of Rome. The Club of Rome uh, was uh, uh, saying a lot of uh, correct uh, and realistic things and uh, uh, warning everybody about the energy situation. But unfortunately, they did, uh, they uh, spoke in such an exaggerated manner that uh, nobody in uh, the political leadership around the world really paid attention to them. So uh, uh, now today we have a situation where everybody is uh, a little bit upset. We uh, uh, also today know that we have uh, hydrocarbon, uh, known resources of hydrocarbon for only a couple of generations at the present use. And uh, we know that uh, we are not uh, really finding enough uh, new uh, resources to keep uh, this uh, figure constant. And that uh, we can see that uh, probably, in, in my guess, uh, my guess is that probably in some four or five generations from now, uh, we will uh, 
uh, see a real problem in uh, hydrocarbon resources. What I'm then very much afraid of is that we haven't prepared ourselves for that situation. Obviously, chemical engineering technology has a lot to do about that, to uh, learn more about how you can drill uh, more efficiently, how you can extract a larger proportion of uh, the oil and uh, gas down there, bring it to the surface, which has a lot to do with uh, technologies uh, involved in also uh, chemical, uh, uh, chemical engineering. You also have uh, the problem of uh, using the resources in a more efficient manner. That is chemical engineering. And uh, <coughs> then, uh, of course, you have the problem of uh, what do we uh, do when we can see the end of hydrocarbon production approaching? Do we uh, let the few who will have hydrocarbons for much longer time than the others? Do we let them uh, set the price? Do we let them uh, uh, create problems for uh, all of us? Or do we prepare ourselves in such a manner that we do not have this uh, fight for, uh, for energy resources between all countries? Do we have to uh, uh, accept that there will be a very serious fight, very serious economic problems between those who have not hydrocarbon resources and those who have. I'm afraid this could be so serious that uh, if we don't uh, right now find out how to prepare ourselves for this situation, then uh, it may lead to uh, very serious political problems between the countries May, maybe even to something uh, approaching war. Now, uh, you ask me what is the most serious problem for uh, uh, chemical engineering. Uh, obviously, my answer here uh, uh, has to do with that, because uh, in order to avoid these problems of energy penury, then uh, we uh, can do a lot in uh, chemical engineering. One thing that we have to do already is to prepare ourselves for uh, reasonable use of uh, coal, brown coal, tar sand, and so on. Uh, this, of course, necessitates uh, a way of uh, converting coal, etc., into uh, uh, all sorts of uh, products. Of course, uh, coal can uh, directly be used to uh, make power and so on, and the chemical engineers uh, have, uh, and uh, all engineers have a job to uh, develop a very uh, efficient way of uh, uh, burning coal under uh, uh, under uh, steam boilers and uh, to create it, try to create uh, uh, electric power in turbines and so on. We in Denmark have had a number of engineers who have worked very efficiently on that, and I think we have a world record in uh, the uh, efficiency in uh, using coal in. Uh, uh, conventional power stations. So uh, that is a, a job uh, reasonably well achieved, but there's an end to it, and the end is in uh, somewhere in the late 40s of uh, uh, the relation between uh, the energy contained in power sent out and the energy in coal. Uh, now and then, you of course also have to be able to convert coal to as a substitute for uh, for liquid hydrocarbons and for uh, natural gas. 
there's a lot of uh, work going on in uh, this field. Uh, in, uh, uh, to my mind, most of uh, all these activities have to go uh, through uh, gasification of coal to create uh, synthesis gas. Uh, some countries are very busy with that. I should mention China, of course, having coal, but uh, only limited resources of hydrocarbons. And this very interesting uh, challenge for chemical engineers, the uh, uh, gasification in itself is an interesting process, which uh, uh, maybe uh, belongs to the realm of the chemical engineers, but then the downstream processing of the crude gas to pure synthesis gas and the conversion of the synthesis gas to, for instance, uh, 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 diesel oil, etc., by a fissure or to gasoline by a process we have developed is very important, and the conversion to uh, uh, synthetic natural gas is very important. Many, many jobs are already going on to do, do all this. But of course, once you have synthesis gas, you not only have a starting point for making a synthetic uh, natural gas and, and diesel and whatnot, gasoline, you also have a starting point for all sorts of chemical industry from uh, the very important fertilizer industry via all sorts of uh, chemicals for uh, for, mono, for polymers, the monomers like uh, uh, ethylene and propylene and so on. And you have a starting point for everything that begins with methanol, goes all the way via formaldehyde and whatnot, and you have a starting point for uh, uh, also uh, using the uh, uh, gasification process for other raw materials than coal. So you also have a starting point to use uh, waste of all sorts of th things, and you even have a starting point for recycling many things. So Dr. Topso, do you want to add a comment about fundamental studies of photosynthesis? Yes, because uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, it would not be impossible that there's something we can all do to improve photosynthesis. Uh, surely we should remind uh, the public that CO2 is uh, not just this uh, devil, the all sort, the green people sort, but it's uh, together with water what created all of us. Exactly. And, uh, Therefore, I think there might be a chance to uh, understanding photosynthesis better, to see exactly what it is that goes on in this uh, uh, process catalyzed by uh, uh, radiation and uh, um, by chlorophyll and so on. I have a hope that uh, some of the work that also we are doing in understanding better what uh, happens in uh, uh, the uh, in the, uh, catalyzed reactions, what happens there, that that may also be a value for understanding photosynthesis better. Okay, thank you. So let me change the subject for a moment. Um, Halder Topsoe has had a long tradition of successful interactions and collaborations with university laboratories. Can you tell us how can be done so that we can strengthen, in general, university industry ties? Well, uh, let me first answer it by saying I think that in many, many countries, and certainly true in my country here, we should make life much easier uh, for university people, easier by uh, uh, increasing the uh, 
relative salary level to university people uh, so that uh, still um, enough really first class youngsters uh, select the uh, work in universities. So uh, I think that is maybe the most important. And therefore that needs in many ways that uh, governments find a way to uh, support uh, fundamental science, to support univers university work. Now here in uh, my country, for instance, uh, there's a lot of talk about uh, having uh, joint ventures between uh, universities and industry. Surely uh, uh, industry must uh, follow what's going on in universities, must support it, must also uh, uh, employ uh, 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 university professors to give them advice about what to do. But I myself uh, am afraid that uh, you place too much emphasis on having professors being business people. I think that uh, uh, it's fine that uh, you can uh, have work done in universities. It's fine that you can have the advice of professors and scientists, but I'm not so sure that the best way uh, forward is to have these so many joint ventures, people talk about in so many countries and also here between uh, universities and uh, industry. Indeed, I don't really like when I see uh, some professors in a university setting up a company. Okay. Thank you. Now, do you have any comments on the present state of chemical engineering education? You, you hire many chemical engineers, say, from DTU or from all over the world. Do you feel that some changes are needed in their education so that they are better prepared to serve state-of-the-art industrial setup as yours? Well, yes, I could say uh, something about that. Uh, first, of course, it depends on what the young people really want. Now, uh, the young people at an early time also long before they come to university, have to decide what they want for themselves in future. And uh, the worst thing there, and that is true for everything, also for chemical engineering, the worst thing is that the youngsters don't know what uh, the practical life would be if they follow a certain career or another one. So the most important thing is that we uh, uh, to answer your question, that we make sure that all the young people uh, in the last uh, years in school, that they are really informed about what it does it mean for their daily life in future to be a chemical engineer. We do what we can, uh, but of course it's very, very limited in a, con in a company like ours to inform uh, the youngsters in uh, the last years in school and their teachers about what it means to uh, work in uh, chemical engineering, whether they go into a uh, uh, government job or into a business job. That's one thing. The other thing is that uh, it's uh, very important for uh, people who really choose to be chemical engineers working in industry. It's very important for them to know what uh, is facing the industry in future in the Western world and, for instance, uh, and everywhere. But I should, I mention Western world because it's very important for the Western world to find out how to really to be competitive. Now, uh, that means that uh, um, young people have to know a lot about what is the geography of uh, industry. Where, where do they uh, emphasize that? Where do they have resources for that? And uh, therefore it's very important for young people to, to know something about what you could call, call the geography of chemical business. And uh, 
The last thing I want to mention is that uh, all, all youngsters wa wanting to go into industry, they have to understand this business of uh, the interplay between science and sailing. So, Dr. Thompson, let me ask you another question. What advice would you give to a young person about the st to start a career in chemical engineering? <coughs> well, of course, first to find a real good uh, university to, to study. And uh, uh, secondly, uh, besides the studies, to complement his uh, knowledge uh, by uh, uh, maybe taking a sabbatical year or two, trying to uh, be uh, allowed to work for other universities, for industries and so on, to uh, uh, improve his understanding of what is required. But uh, I would very much advise him, if he wants to go into industry, to also make sure that he knows about uh, uh, the economics of business. And uh, also, I would very much advise him to understand that if he wants to be an important person in uh, a business company, he has to know how to sell, how to develop. Then people are always talking about uh, leadership. So uh, thousands and thousands are going to uh, learn how to be a leader. Uh, well, I, I don't know about that, but surely you have to know how to interact with people. And I think that surely leadership is important. Things have to be organized and all that. But I think that in daily life, to be uh, really uh, a, a good colleague, to be uh, a good friend of your neighbors, to help your neighbors when they need help, to be available. I think that uh, that is very, very important. Of course, that's not something that uh, you can teach people. They cannot go to a course to learn that, but uh, uh, they can, uh, uh, they can uh, try and uh, uh, work under circumstances where that is important because uh, it's so important and it means uh, uh, it has, a, shall we say, a compensation in itself. Because if you uh, really try to your level best to be a good colleague, to be a good friend, then uh, uh, you will also be uh, uh, happy to see how uh, people will rely upon you and help you when you need. I don't know whether I answered your question. That was a very nice answer. Thank you. So let me add, uh, ask another question here. We are closing into an end here. Uh, thinking of the past century and looking into the future, what do you think are the most critical challenges chemical engineering is faced with? Well, I, didn't I answer that already by saying something about energy? Exactly. Yeah. Right. But, uh, well, I think that uh, uh, very uh, interesting challenge is, of course, to understand things better. I think I touched upon this. Uh, well, uh, <coughs> a chemical engineer, he cannot be uh, uh, fully uh, informed uh, chemist unless he knows about uh, uh, in situ work, knows about what goes on on atomic level, on uh, molecular levels and so on. And uh, uh, therefore the, uh, the challenge is to uh, participate in work that will give us more fundamental knowledge. What is really happening when uh, f feed molecules approach a catalyst surface, what's happening that makes them uh, stay there, 
uh, what uh, situation would the size be in uh, that keep them there? What happens when they uh, react uh, on the uh, surface side? What happens when they then uh, leave the surface again? And uh, uh, to understand all that uh, also means to understand it on the situation that really happens in uh, nature or in industry. And uh, that means that you have to understand, uh, you have to do in situ experiments. And uh, uh, this has always been of great interest to us. When uh, I was a youngster, I thought that uh, a better understanding of all this would be just around the corner. We had all the new things with X-rays and moss power and what have you. But it wasn't just around the corner. I think it's only in the last few years that we really understand what is uh, happening, at least for a number of processes. I'm not saying we understand it for everything. But also, we have had the problem that uh, some of the most efficient uh, tools for, for investigations could uh, be used only on uh, situations very, very different from uh, uh, the practical. I'm particularly talking about pressure and about uh, electron microscopy. Uh, I uh, think that we have a good chance to uh, doing electron microscopy under atmospheric pressure. We work with some friends in Holland about that. We have two units capable of doing uh, work under, high pre under much higher pressure than you normally use, even atmospheric pressure. And we would do our utmost to bring that uh, forward. So uh, uh, that means that, uh, uh, I'm talking so much about that, that means that one of the important tools to really see what is the uh, atomic structure of something can also be used under conditions uh, where you, some reactions take place uh, on the surface of a catalyst. Okay. I think that uh, uh, the whole business of uh, using in situ studies more and more is a big, big challenge. But then, of course, you can't do experimental work unless you also, uh, from theoretical work, understand what it really means, what, what does it mean, what you are seeing? And therefore, uh, when you and others uh, worked uh, to, with this uh, DFT uh, that uh, some of our good friends here in Denmark have been very uh, good at developing, and where you also have some very interesting work done elsewhere in France and in the States and so on, I think it's very important that we really can uh, marry the, the uh, in situ observations uh, of experimental character with uh, uh, fundamental, uh, you might say, mathematical studies okay. of all the energy, uh, energy steps involved. Great, thank you. So, Dr. Tops, I asked you several questions. I always like to ask a last question, that is, is there anything that you would like to add to this conversation that I didn't ask you about, perhaps, and you feel that would be important for the general audience and readership of annual reviews in chemical and biomolecular engineering? Well, I think I have said what I can say uh, about this you call molecular engineering, uh, a peculiar term. Uh, I do hope that we can also uh, do the work we are doing in uh, biofield. I do hope that we can manage to understand better what is happening uh, between uh, 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 chemical, pharmaceutical, chemical, and uh, uh, living cells, and how uh, this uh, React interaction really takes place. I do hope we can understand that, and with some friends, we also are having a small project 
to try and contribute there. But uh, what else can I say? I did say a lot about uh, uh, fundamentals and business selling and so on. You also asked me a little bit about what was important during my life. I would say that maybe uh, I really learned uh, how to uh, combine uh, uh, science and uh, industry, new, develop new things, new products, new knowledge. And so I, I think I learned more about that during the war years and following years in Sweden, because there you had a number of people uh, doing very important scientific work in the fields we are interested in. And you had some uh, industrial groups which were admirably uh, using uh, 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 basic work, basic engineering work also, and creating very important businesses. So I think that I also owe a lot of thanks to uh, people in, uh, in business in Sweden for what they taught me about this interplay. So my last uh, uh, word should be, uh, uh, again, uh, all, uh, all people interested in these fields must again and again ask themselves how to come from fundamental to knowledge to industry. Okay. Well, it was a pleasure and an honor to conduct this interview on behalf of Annual Reviews, Dr. Topsoy, and I want to thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much. I also enjoyed this uh, discussion, which uh, might call, be called an interview. I hope that uh, we managed to say something that would be of interest, and particularly of interest to young people. And I do hope that uh, what uh, your publication is uh, uh, doing will also be very useful to help that in future we can uh, be competitive. Because uh, if uh, one country or one area of the world runs ahead of all of us and we can't compete with them, then we'll have a dangerous situation. So let me express this hope. Okay. Thank you very much again, sir. It was an Thank honor you. and a pleasure. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks very much, old friend. Thank you.